Okay. So welcome again to this session. Now we are recording so others can see this as well potentially. And I yeah, wanna, wanna welcome from all of my heart, Tom Little, uh, Noongar Elder, a musician, writer, and um, translator of the Noongar language. You are founding at the moment uh, the Noongar Language Center in Perth. And yes. you're translating the Bible. And you are here today to share something about let me let me read it out. <laughs> Karajining and vanajining, so dreaming and healing, and what it has to do with with dragon dreaming, with love in action. So I'm very happy mm. um, to hear more about that and then go into a dialogue. Well, uh, the story I told about the the bobtail and the snake um, is a story that portrays observance. So the person observing that bobtail was able to discover a cure for that snake bite. Um, so that is you know, self-development right from the start. And uh, by observing, was able to then uh, provide uh, a cure for that snake bite for the, uh, his community. So that's community development in action as well. And by observing, understanding, and knowing that Bobtail's habit uh, was able to um, uh, fulfill a commitment, if you like, to the community and also to the ecosystem, to, to the world around us. So there's your, your three great attributes of dragon dreaming, self-development, which which leads, of course, to self-awareness, community development, which leads to solidarity and strength in the community, and also by observing the world and taking a lesson out of the ecology to take to the people, um, honouring the ecology as well, because that person who first got that totem who was first first received that totem, uh, then had the responsibility to teach it to the rest of the community, and so develop uh, a bond, a linkage between part of the ecology and the community itself. And I firmly believe that that's what dragon dreaming is all about. So you I, look stunned. <laughs> I, I, I like, actually like to, to invite um, those with question marks or those with inspiration to uh, already share a yes, question. Please. Yes, Tom, I do have a question, if I may. Um, I've been trying to share with my people about like the totem stories and how how do we get involved with this um, our inborn um, um, intelligence? But how do you like? How do people in your tribe actually get the totem? And how does the different totems work with each other? Yeah, it, it very much depends on their status within the uh, group. Uh, if they're just an ordinary family member, then. Um, the, the older members of the family will observe them. They will get a, um, a totem at birth. So it could be something that is seen in the community. Um, like uh, my mother, well, so I'll start with my, well, one of my daughters has a totem called Kulbadi. Kulbadi is the magpie. It's a black and white bird. And on the night that this daughter was born, um, I, when I came home from the hospital, um, you know, visiting my wife and meeting my daughter for the first time, there was a storm. It was raining. But right through the middle of the storm, the magpies were singing. And when I spoke to my mother about it, she said, well, now you know what her, totem, her, birth, her birth totem is. So uh, my uh, youngest daughter, she became Kulbadi, which is her birth totem. 
Now, at the same time, that night was the first night of the new moon. So there was a very faint crescent of, of the moon in the sky. When we gave her her names, her first name is Emma. Her middle name is Mika, which is a derivation of our word Miak for the moon. So she's our moon child. And it's funny because the other daughter, when she was born, there was no moon. So she's star baby. Her, her middle name is Jinda. And her, her totem is different. Again, she's a possum. She's a, a kumal totem. And the possum um, is a nocturnal animal. And my daughter wouldn't sleep at night time. She wanted to be up and playing at night time. So she became uh, kumal, which is the possum. So uh, often the totem is given by a characteristic portrayed by the person or by some observance that happens at or very close to their birth. Thank you. And does that have any, um, have any significance in how do you, how do you people work together according to their different totems? Yeah, look, totems are very important because for one, you're given a totem, you have to learn that animal's characteristics. It's like a spirit guide. You have to learn what it eats, you have to learn what eats it, and you have to learn how those things balance in nature. So, because like, you know, if you kill too many tiger snakes, they don't eat the frogs. And I'm a frog totem, I know this. Um, if you kill too many tiger snakes and the frogs uh, are overabundant, they'll dominate the ecosystem. So the tiger snakes are there to keep them in balance and to keep them from becoming, um, from overpowering the ecosystem. And uh, each animal has its nemesis, but it also has its prey. So you have to understand how it works, sort of like up and down the food chain, if you like, so that you can do your part to keep the balance of nature, of, of the ecosystem uh, you know, uh, alive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. I have a technical question. Are you holding your phone or is it? Um... Yeah, I am. <laughs> Maybe you can find a place on your desk where you put it and lean it against the book or something so it's That's more comfortable for you and we can also see see you. I hope nothing happens with the image. <laughs> oh, what's going on here? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I know, but uh, the trouble is I'm still holding the phone and ah. the picture has gone. The picture has gone small, so maybe when you turn it back bigger. Uh, where are we? Maybe you switched your camera off. Ah. Now it's on again. Yeah, that's got it. How's that? Much better. Now we can see you. Mm. Yeah, and you don't have to hold it. Yeah, good. Yep. Um, that was just a technical thing from my side. So please, <laughs> Thank you for that. please continue the, the conversation or dialogue. Um, if there's any anything you're curious about, can be of regarding the totems or something new? Mm. Well, the totem system was meant and developed so that we could understand the ecosystem. And see, that, that was our major ethos, was the fact that we lived within the system, not in spite of it or outside of it. Because we were you know, right in the middle of it, we had to learn to survive it, so we had to learn to understand it. And because there were several different totems, well, many different totems, um, if at least one person in a group had responsibility for each of the uh, Yeah, the animals, the local animals, and um, even you know some uh, physical features, uh, you know, rock, mountain, river, that sort of thing. They all had their own totem. Um, what it meant was that uh, 
everyone in some way was caring for some part of the uh, ecosystem. And there, there is a hard and fast rule that um, you do not hunt or eat your totem because it is assumed that you know them so well that you'd know where to find them, how to hunt them, and how to successfully um, kill them, basically. So um, the control of the animal was left to others. And the person whose totem it was their responsibility was to ensure its survival. So, you know, you had give and take in every situation. That's like me, I've never eaten frog's legs. <laughs> I I wonder, I, I would like to come back um, to also more to the connection to Dragon Dreaming, but I want to give the word to Liz first. Just mm -hmm. see your hand is up. Hi, Tom. Uh, I I would like to hear from you two things. It's first of all, it's it's correct to call Aboriginal people tribe. It is constantly is a discussion about. Include with John, we have this discussion. Yep. No, we cannot talk about Aboriginal people as a tribe. And the second one is uh, we know in the old, oldest research, they consider Aboriginal people as a hunters. But actually, a new research say this culture is a farmers. I'd like to hear about that because I feel it is a research from people outside the culture and make mm -hmm. this research. Yeah, uh, look, um, most of our diet was lacking in meat for most of the year. So we had to um, you know, husband our resources very carefully, including the resources of plants, of um, vegetables and things like that. So, yes, there was a large component of um, farming to the extent that uh, we knew where in our patch uh, the vegetables uh, proliferated and we knew, uh, you know, sort of where the best places were to gather them. But we also knew where the best time, uh, you know, what time of the season of the year it was best to cultivate them, if you like. And you know, what time of the year it was smart to keep particular animals away from them so that they didn't compete with us for those food sources. So, yeah, that is a form of um, farming, certainly. And, in fact, uh, you know, on the East Coast, um, there were lots of uh, sedentary farming peoples who farm things like uh, millet. Um, the millet, there, there is a, a millet belt which stretched across Australia from where our wheat belt is here in the west right across to the uh, across central Australia to the east to where the, um, uh, around about the Hunter Valley, which is about the same latitude as, uh, as Perth is. And... Uh, they harvested a form of grain that was, uh, well, they call it millet now. It was very similar to that. And in fact, um, a lot of our people believe that spinifex is the wild version of that millet. And spinifex still covers much of central Australia. And it was actively harvested. It was actively farmed. And uh, in fact, when the first well, first non-Indigenous explorers went through what they call the millet belt now, they couldn't believe how um, fertile the soil was and how friable it was, how um, uh, aerated and how well uh, cultivated it was. That, of course, has since disappeared, unfortunately, because, um, you know, there was 
after the frontier wars, there were virtually no one to um, practice that uh, harvesting. And in fact, uh, in in some and some, um, I, I recommend you a book called The Dark Emu by a man called Bruce Pascoe. He's an Aboriginal man from the Eastern States. And he writes extensively on this. And uh, his um, research and revelations um, are not from an Indigenous perspective because what he did was he went back and he examined all the early writings of the invaders, of the settlers, um, and basically told the stories that they told each other about what the land was like before they got here. And what's about the called the tribe? We could say that as a tribe. Yeah, um, I have no issue with using the word tribe. Mm. Um, yeah, we, we do have other words that we use, like clan groups, like family groups, like communities. Mm. Uh, and in fact, um, here in Australia, a lot of the Indigenous people are starting to talk about various nations like the Native Americans do. Mm. So like here in the southwest of Western Australia, we have a Noongar nation, mm. although strictly speaking, that's not our name either. Our name is Bibbleman. But the Bibbleman Nation covers the whole of the Southwest area. And uh, in that uh, nation group, there are 19 or 20 different language groups and uh, at least as many as that of you know, recognisably different peoples. Could you repeat the name of the book? I could not understand. Yeah, uh, it's called The Dark Emu. And it's written by a man called Bruce Pascoe, P-A-S-C-O-E. Thank you. I, I would like, uh, Tom, actually to hear you speak a bit about the concept of dreaming because that's mm -hmm. such a big word in, in dragon dreaming. And it's like the research I did, it's like, uh, um, yeah, it's it's very different um, concept than the dreaming just at night. Yes. Well, what do dreams do? Dreams point out to us uh, desires, um, possibilities. Um, yeah, uh, we also, uh, when we dream, we unconsciously um, uh, bring up stuff that we've learned so that, uh, yeah, we help ourselves and each other to remember things by dreaming. So it's a more important function than just lying asleep at night with things going through your head. Um, yeah, we call it karajinin which is our word for knowledge and learning, because in the process of dreaming, we also learn and come to know stuff about ourselves, about uh, our ecology, about our communities, and about the wider world that are vital to us. So it's uh, it, in, in our culture, dreaming is a formalized process. And in fact, it's the same with many uh, ancient and or indigenous cultures. I mean, they say that Stonehenge in England was one of the biggest uh, dream catches ever made and was designed to, um, as a feedback loop, if you like, back into that dreaming process that gives us the function of memory and creates uh, neural pathways. But also, yeah, it's not just that, you know, dr dreaming is not just um, remembering and learning. Dreaming is also imagining. And uh, 
imagination brings creativity. And the world needs as much creativity as it can get right now. I honestly believe that by, um, and, and this is another function of the uh, conversation I had with John Croft today. Um, we have to create a world that we can live in that's better than the one we've got now. To do that requires a lot of imagination, a lot of commitment, and a lot of dialogue. We need to talk to each other about what we need from this world. And we need to understand that we're the only ones that can do that. You, me, the people sitting around these screens, but also the whole world requires a big dose of creativity because we need to create the things that will make this world right for us. And that doesn't mean we need to um, stop mining coal, although that would help. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to stop polluting the earth, although that will help. But we also have to realise that at the rate that we're consuming unless we find some creative solutions to that consumerism, we're going to run out of world to live in. So it's, it's a lot deeper process. Yeah, we talk about deep listening. Well, deep dreaming is every bit as crucial. Mm. And we need people to create beauty the reason we need people to create beauty is that yeah plato said it you know a thousand years before christ verily it is by beauty that we come at wisdom you know we got to learn and if we create beauty around us that creates the environment in which it's far easier to learn Hmm. There's been a question from Renato. How mm -hmm. do you do deep dreaming? Deep dreaming is actually dreaming with awareness. Um, yeah, going into a state of dream that you recognize as something crucial, that you recognize as something strong, and that you recognize as something that offers you, um, you know, potential information, um, designs, if you like. Um, yeah, using your imagination, you can actually start coming up with solutions. And we, yeah, maybe other animals do dream, but none dream as deeply as we do. And it's our dreams that are crucial to the survival of this planet. I wonder, Tom, um, if like you, like what I'm hearing a little bit, bit is like, yeah, it's really about creating what we imagine is possible. And dream, dreaming is a a tool you got to know it in a workshop with Liz and John is a Absolutely. is a tool um to yeah to support dreaming and creating i wonder if you feel like this is like this is a tool for western people to learn to do things a bit more the way Noongar people do it or if you feel ah that's actually a really cool tool for everybody also for Noongar people like oh, is it, look, yeah. what what do you we, think about all, the, 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 the the methodology and the process of dragon dreaming and its value? We've all got to do it. It's as simple as that. Um, the dream is the thing that we can keep alive and keep coming back to time and time again. And every time we dream about, well, I find with me, every time I dream about any particular thing, 
if I dream about it again, say it might be on two or three successive nights, I eventually learn pathways between myself, the dream, and the outcome. And that's what we've got to do. That's deep dreaming. That's looking for our for solutions and outcomes. And every human being has that capability. And um, and and uh, like the the method of doing a dream circle and doing objective setting and doing a game board, a car beard. Um, yeah, you see, this is also like actually helpful. Um, yes, absolutely. For for uh, like Noongar people doing projects as well as for people from other yes. cultures. Yes. In, in our culture, we say the dream is everything because that's how important it is. By dreaming, we're exploring our own mind, our own psyche, our own education, our own abilities to find ways of creating something different, creating something new. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Tom. I also meant the, actually other methods, but maybe Lissandra has something to that. Are you mute? I will uh, reflect a little bit more about dream because we here in Occident is known West in this culture. That is, first of all, there is many, many theories are, around dream. Second, there is many new, new age ways, a pathway, spiritual way that uh, work and talk and use dreams to for the I could say personal growth or whatever. What we see is um, here in our white occidental culture have so many concepts approach for dream and so many mix with the indigenous culture or spiritual culture and what i see is uh, a completely mistake and misunderstood about dream here because everything together without separate the thought lines or pathways no and in, many in dragon dreaming also with dragon dreamers have the um the dream is like a magnetic and they attract so much this concept. Yeah? I would like to hear from you and we can reflect here about that. How we can uh, take this knowledge from Aboriginal people you know, about dream, considering we are here in this culture with a lot of kinds of concepts, theories, and approaches, you no? Know? Mm. And what we, because in Dragon Dreaming, we use as a dream that this concept of to be open for possibilities, to be open for that, you know? And also with the inspiration from Aboriginal. I prefer to say inspiration than to say exactly from Aboriginal. And yes, I'd like to reflect a little bit about that. Mm. I yeah, don't look, know if I was uh, clear enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's clear as mud. <laughs> Best way to be. Um, look, uh, what we do with our dreams and what everybody should be doing with our dreams is applying them to the real world. The issue in Western culture with dreams is that um, they're mystified. They're mythologized. They're um, taken as being a separate part of us that has no place in the real world. Um, and it's the same with uh, Christianity, with, you know, with um, spiritualism. Uh, again, in the Western culture, they, that, that tends to be mythologized. And as a result, um, considered to be 
only the province of adepts, which is just simply not true. Everybody has the potential to dream. I mean, some of my best songs that I've ever written have woken me up at three o'clock in the morning after I've dreamed about them and said to me, okay, now go and write me down. You know, and that's a fairly basic principle of dreaming and of applying your dream to your world. Do you I see like, what I'm getting at? Yeah. I like Sorry, you were saying? No, no, I thought you have finished. All right. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I, I really connect with when, what you say about methodology, methodology, the dream. And it's like mm. that. And I feel the same. Yesterday we had this discussion in my session with John. As when you mm -hmm. say also about a dialogue or when you say about communication, it's like, let's put a method here. And then yep. we will find a way to, to talk or find a way to dream if we follow this method. And yes. is, is it, it, what I understand, it's not to follow some method, but learn to connect with the dream from our intimacy and uh, something like that. And I, I yeah. studied the, I don't know if you know about the Senoi people. It's from Malaysia. And they mm -hmm. also, it's a group really, uh, uh, there is quite a research about them. And what they report is in this, is traditional in that families in this group, they share their dream in the morning. It is the mm -hmm. way of stimulate the family and the group to connect with the dream and also to create intimacy between people and with themselves. Yeah. Do you think it is the logical makes sense and they also from it could be a way of reconnect with the dream through the Aboriginal perspective? Mm. It's sharing the yes, dream, I no? Tell about yeah, the dream. I, I like that. And that's uh, a common practice amongst Nyungas is you have a dream, you tell somebody about it. Mm. You know, it's called dialogue because there's two people involved or there's more than one person involved. Mm. And dialogue between dreamers is a very enhanced form of communication. Mm. And uh, we should be looking to do more of that than to you know, have development workshops and things like that, <laughs> you know? Well, and it is the dragon dreaming too, no? When we have the dream as a project, we say yep. you need to share with people for makes this dream become true. So it's based yep. on this logical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, nice. Love that, Liz. Absolutely love, love that. It's a great concept. Yeah. We should all learn that. <laughs> yes. I see. I see Frederica uh, raising her hand. Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've been applying dragon dreaming um, in workshops, but especially uh, in my own life. And then I also took that into coaching sessions. So working with people one on one. And bringing in basically the philosophy, the, the what is behind it, and bringing in that, that into daily practice, and and um, what you, Lizanne, and you, Tom, were sharing, it reminded me that a lot of times um, people have have these feelings inside of them, but since in in Western culture and, and especially Germany, I'm from Germany. I live in Belgium. Um, we we tend to see the feelings as separate from our daily lives, so yep. people don't have words for them. And um, but but people do dream, and they can they can share their dreams. Yeah. And what I what I found is that once people started sharing their dreams. Mm. Um, they slowly connected words with the feelings that they had, that they have. And um, yeah, so I, I, 
I kind of find ways of connect people <laughs> to their feelings, to who they they are also, because that's part of them. Um, without, yeah, without them thinking, ah, this is separate from me, or this is I I have to share my dreams, but I I yeah. indirectly try to make my way so that they do find that connection, that they do find the words to to connect who they also are. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, one of the worst things the English language ever did was make the word dreamer a derogatory word because all of our most, you know, all of our highest achievements as human beings come from dreams. Unfortunately, um, you know, Western religion, Western business, and uh, the Western way of life, I won't say culture because, you know, dreaming is a part of every culture and should be. Um, but the way we live tends to make us suppress our dreams or tends to make us not give our dreams the real value and credence they deserve. And that's our, our, our word, karajini, which is you know, the, one of the words that describes this session. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only dreaming, but it's also learning and it's also um, teaching as well, the passing on of that dreaming and learning. So yeah, in our culture, um, dreaming is a process that's, yeah, crucial to our development as human beings. And I love the fact that you're joining that all together and taking it into teaching people how to live. That's marvellous. Well done. Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you so much. I see Louise. And I want to also say we have 15 more minutes. I want to stay in time. I know you are all very busy. And um, and I want to like move after I heard Luis also a bit more towards the healing aspect of that. Also, like what we put out there as as a content of the session. But please, Luis, we haven't heard you yet. Please share. Um, I have two things coming up again and again in my mind um, about the connection about the naturality of dreaming uh, in the Noongar culture. Maybe, or maybe you can say something about it. I, I want to hear from you. If you think it's so easy for the Noongar people to dream because they are so much more connected to nature, because they are embedded in nature rather than um, reflecting upon nature or observing nature, they are part of it. Do you think this this strong connection to nature makes it easier to dream in the way you understand dreaming? Yeah, I, I get your question. And it's a, a crucial one because dreaming is, uh, yeah, has, has always been a part of our culture. But over the last 250 years, there has been so much trauma added to our culture that uh, the dreaming can be impossible to find at times. Uh, and the, uh, yeah, our traditional ways of living were so much less stressful or so stress-free that our minds were freer to dream than they are these days. So uh, yes, that had, yeah. Um, traditionally, I would have said yes. In the modern context, I would say the dreaming for us is just as hard as for everybody else. Mm. Um, it's probably lucky that there are still a few of us around who remember what that process was and um, how valuable it is. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I also like the, the image of connecting to the dreams because it's it's a feeling like the dreams are there and you just need to connect to them. It's not like something you need to force within your mind and create yeah. it by um, purpose. 
but it's rather mm. opening up to what's already there. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, I, I liken it to songwriting. I mean, I can be, you know, driving in my car or riding a push bike down the road or walking to the bus stop or whatever. And it may be just two or three words that trigger mm. a dream or a song or um, an important experience that I have to pass on to somebody else to let them know that it's possible for them to use the same process. Mm. Thanks. And, and sorry. Yeah, that, and our, our word karajini means sharing all of that process. You know? It means passing on what we've dreamt and learned and, and to teach others about it. And uh, the first and most crucial um, uh, concept you have to learn for healing is dialogue. As Liz was saying a little bit earlier on, she was talking with John Croft, and I was too yesterday, uh, sorry, today. And uh, yeah, I've reached the conclusion that um, the dialogue is, is uh, the crucial part of um, passing on the information. But also, it's uh, you now by sharing the information is how we heal ourselves and each other. And we also um, you know, use that process, that process of dialogue, um, to solidify our own ideas so that we can pass them on as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. There was a question of Hema about the, the word for passing on. Is it not also karshining, dreaming, learning, teaching, passing yeah, on? Dream. Yeah, dreaming, learning, knowing, teaching. Karajini. Yeah. And then there is this other word, wanajining. Would you like healing. would you like to, to share a little bit more about that? And then I would like to actually have a have a checkout um, sharing our aha moments. Mm -hmm. We have a saying in our culture, Kanya. Kanya is spirit, so healing our spirit. And the way we do that is to talk to each other. And this is where the deep listening comes in, because listening is also a crucial part of talking. And uh, by listening carefully, we actually start to hear, not only in our mind, but in our spirit as well, what the issues are and how we can go about healing. Hmm. And yeah, you know, I, I get questioned, yeah, you because know, I, I translate and I'm currently translating parts of the Bible. And I get questioned by people who uh, have no knowledge of what my process is um, as to you know, why I should be um, translating and honoring basically a, a post-colonial narrative, a text that uh, is forced on the victims by the victors. And my answer to that, that is there's no time like the present to start a healing process. We all have it within us to start a healing process. The way we do that is to talk to each other openly, honestly, and from our hearts. Because hmm. reconciliation is simply healing in action. And, uh, yeah, I hear Aboriginal people say, but we got nothing to reconcile. And in a limited way, that may be true. But the dialogue doesn't start unless we start it. Hmm. Beautiful, Frederica just wrote, reconciliation is healing in action. Yep, absolutely. And this is what is so important to make our successful projects happening. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I was talking, yeah, as I was talking with John Croft today, 
we were throwing ideas into this conversation. And some of those ideas were only just occurring to us as we were throwing them in there. And that's the process in a nutshell, you know, to say it, to see what it sounds like and to see how we can use it. Hmm. <laughs> Gudelike raised her hand. Yes, um, Tom, I admire your, your action and um, it makes me recognize that no matter where we are as people in the world, we do have similar, yeah, similar stories of, of trauma and necess necessity for healing. And uh, in, in Europe, it's the story of, um, of coloni colonizing, colonization and, and um, having to live with the burden of, for example, being a, a German, being being born in Germany, having German ancestors, and then being labeled as yeah, but you come from the the the, um, the nation of Nazis, and oh. uh, do with with literature um, that uh, depicts um, yeah actions against Aborigines that were popular fifty or a hundred years ago. What do you do with that? Do we throw it away? Um, at the same time, we can also say hey we have we have the moment now and we can be in dialogue we can be in conversation about these stories because these stories they were made for a reason because of the time then and we can we can take them that's my point of view we can take them and and have a conversation around and, and create new stories yeah it's the old hegelian principle isn't it yeah synthesis antithesis or thesis antithesis, bring them together and create a new synthesis. Yeah. I've got to tell you this before we finish. Today I was at the shops with my wife and uh, I was engaged in conversation by a guy who was uh, from Morocco. He was a Berber. And he told me the story of the French colonisation of Morocco and how there were Berbers who never saw flat land because when they had to run from the French, they ran to the, the mountains. And when they got into the mountains, um, they were able to hide. And so they um, were able to survive. And it was a very interesting um, talk to him because he basically iterated the colonisation process here in Australia. But he also said, do you know what I do with people, uh, with French people I meet these days? I said, no. He said, I cook them a meal. Imagine the healing in that. Hmm. And the man just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, it's... Um... It accused to me, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a choice, um, and also a privilege to say I'm, I'm ready for dialogue, and healing, and also I acknowledge that not everybody who has experienced traumatizing events, and yeah, is carrying that in their ancestors' lineage, has the privilege to be ready for that, and I, I celebrate um, every every opportunity um, that allows that. And also this is the reason why I'm so happy that you've been open actually to talk to us and build this bridge between Nungar people and um, Dragon Dreamers, since I feel it's a possibility to share a culture that is more inspiring than what I've learned. Um, so thank you so much. I yeah. I feel like I we have three minutes left, but maybe we can make a closing round, still sharing a word, a sentence, something that inspired you, an aha moment, or even an uhu moment, open question, whatever. Yep. Well, I can... Start with everyone else. <laughs> I've been talking too much. <laughs> I can I can start. Um, 
my aha moment is that the healing starts with the with the dialogue with the willingness to get in contact and in conversation yep it all I starts with it. two people talking <laughs> hmm. i pass it to renato i i think about uh, simplicity and when i connect with you and with people more indigenous people or also in some in some lines of spirituality i can see the life is so simple and we can make the things simple and in some level with west people west culture complicated so much uh, i i stay with this word simple Let's just make the things simple. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Tom. Good to see You're you. Welcome. Good to see you too, Liz. Thank you, Tom. It was great to listen to you. Thank you, Manuela, uh, for organizing this and, and facilitating. Uh, I think for me, the the that idea of um, you know deep deep dreaming. You know, just the concept of, you know, push it further, you know, be more open, be more aware and exercises, practice it, right? Yes. That's something I'm taking with me. So thank you. Good. I pass to Luis. Yeah, I'd like to thank you both to, um, for, for offering this session. It was really heartwarming and I also take this idea of talking to each other a dialogue is the is starting to heal um, it's a very important concept or idea I think it should be put in action more and more thanks and I pass on to Hema thank you uh, for Nalula to organize this session and for Tom for offering your wisdom. I think my major takeaway is like how sharing our dreams could become a healing process and to create a totally new world, like raise a different consciousness in the people in dialogue. I think it's a very important and it's adding totally a different layer to Dragon Dreaming that I already know. So thank you so much. I pass on to Frederick. Yeah, um, my takeaway is also the being in dialogue, being in conversation as a passageway to healing. And I connected to what you said, Tom, or what you, you made present in the beginning. Again, again um, the, the personal development, the conversation, being in conversation with ourselves um, so that we can heal and then being in conversation with others, being in community, sharing our dreams um, and learning from each other, teaching each other uh, where the healing can take place. And then the story you shared in the beginning about the blue tongued um, <laughs> animal <laughs> lizard, uh, which is being in, in conversation with nature and being in dialogue with nature. And they're also, uh, contributing to healing so so that's that's kind of the, the connection I make from the beginning to now like being in dialogue but on all levels yeah yeah and yeah thank you Manuela and thank you Tom for for being here and for organizing and for being that bridge being that that uh yeah conversation partner <laughs> and for everyone else who's here on the call as well mm -hmm. it's been yeah I, I feel it very deep deep in connection with every one of you right I pass back to Manuela I want to give the last words to Tom okay final word dreaming ain't easy dreaming is a lifetime lifetime and total commitment but 
if you carry nothing with you into the process but a warm and open heart, you will see amazing things happen. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, everybody, for this time and re common reflection. Have a beautiful afternoon, evening, night, whatever is ahead in you, for you. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.